The title of this lecture is Monasticism. What is monasticism? Monasticism refers to the regimen of life practiced by monks. It originated in the deserts of northern Egypt in the 3rd century AD. There are in fact two types of monastic life, both of which we will look at in this presentation. They are Eremitic monasticism and Cenobitic monasticism. Eremitic monasticism refers to monasticism lived in individual isolation, that is, the life of a hermit. Cenobitic, on the other hand, refers to monastic life practiced in a communal setting, that is, in a monastery. The father of Eremitic monasticism is Anthony of Egypt. He was born around 251 AD and died in 356, so he lived to the ripe old age of 105. He was the son of a wealthy family, but his parents died when Antony was only 18. Wondering what to do with the, with the wealth the, that he had inherited, while he was in church, he heard the call of Jesus read from the gospel. If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. Anthony took this as applying directly to himself. Thus, he sold his possessions, placed his younger sister in the care of a group of nuns, and went to live in the desert. Antony went to live in a remote, abandoned Roman fort. In his isolation, he devoted himself to fasting, physical deprivation, and long hours of prayer. In this situation, he was relentlessly attacked by the devil. We read in his biography, But the devil, who hates and envies what is good, could not endure to see such a resolution in a youth, but endeavored to carry out against him what he had been wont to effect against others. First of all, he tried to lead him away from the discipline, whispering to him the remembrance of his wealth, care for his sister, claims of kindred, love of money, love of glory, the various pleasures of the table, and other relaxations of life, and at last the difficulty of virtue and the labor of it. He suggested also the infirmity of the body and the length of the time. In a word, he raised in his mind a great dust of debate, wishing to debar him from his settled purpose. But when the enemy saw himself to be too weak for Antony's determination, and that he rather was conquered by the other's firmness, overthrown by his great faith and falling through his constant prayers, then at length putting his trust in the weapons which are in the navel of his belly, and boasting in them, for they are his first snare for the young, he attacked the young man, disturbing him by night and harassing him by day, so that even the onlooker saw the struggle which was going on between them. The one would suggest foul thoughts, and the other counter them with prayers. The one fire him with lust, the other, as one who seemed to blush, fortify his body with faith, prayers, and fasting. And the devil, unhappy wight, one night even took upon him the shape of a woman and imitated all her acts simply to beguile Antony. But he, his mind filled with Christ and the nobility inspired by him, and considering the spir spirituality of the soul, quenched the coal of the other's deceit. Again the enemy suggested the ease of pleasure, but he, like a man filled with rage and grief, turned his thoughts to the threatened fire and the gnawing worm, and setting these in array against his adversary, passed through the temptation unscathed. And this was a source of shame to his foe, for he, deeming himself like God, was now mocked by a young man, and he who boasted himself against flesh and blood was being put to flight by a man in the flesh. For the Lord was working with Antony, the Lord who for our sake took flesh and gave the body victory over the devil, so that all who truly fight can say, Not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Thus we see Antony as the, par the paradigm of spiritual warfare, doing battle against the devil and his minions. Antony soon developed a reputation for holiness. People came to him seeking spiritual advice, and he attracted followers who set up their own huts near his abode. His life became thus the paradigm or model for the ascetical life, and the life of Antony, written by Athanasius, became widely read.
Now I said that Antony was the model or paradigm of the ascetical life. That's a reference to asceticism. Now asceticism involves denying oneself legitimate bodily goods for the sake of a higher spiritual good. Examples of this include fasting, long periods of prayer during which one deprives oneself of sleep, a bodily good, wearing coarse and uncomfortable clothes, bathing in cold water, and such things. Such practices are always accompanied by prayer and meditation for the purpose of fixing the mind upon God and God alone. Asceticism thus understood is essential to the monastic life. We turn now to Cenobitic monasticism, that is communal monasticism. And for this, we look to the life of St. Pacomius. Pacomius converted to Christianity from paganism. Upon his conversion, he became a hermit, but after six or seven years, decided to establish a community of monks. Pacomius found that a communal setting, with both spiritual and material support, was the most conducive to successfully leading the monastic life. However, such a life lived in common could easily become chaotic. To offset this tendency, Pacomius composed a rule for monks to regulate life in his community. The rule had specified times for prayer and work. In the course of his life, Pacomius founded a total of nine monasteries, seven for men and two for women. We now come to Benedict of Nursia. He is the father of Cenobitic monasticism in Western Europe. Like Pacomius, Benedict composed a rule for monks which became the standard regimen for all monasteries in the West. In the prologue to the rule, Benedict emphasizes two things, listening and obedience. The rule reads, Listen, my son, to your master's precepts, and incline the ear of your heart. Receive willingly and carry out effectively your loving father's advice that by the labor of obedience you may return to him from whom you had departed by the sloth of disobedience. In addition, Benedict uses three metaphors or images of the monastic life in his rule. First, he understands the monastery as a battlefield. He writes, we must prepare our hearts and our bodies to do battle under the holy obedience of his commands. And let us ask God that he be pleased to give us the help of his grace for anything which our nature finds hardly possible. And if we want to escape the pains of hell and attain life everlasting, then, while there is still time, while we are still in the body and are able to fulfill all these things by the light of this life, we must hasten to do now what will profit us for eternity. Second, Benedict envisions the monastery as a school. He writes, We are going to establish a school for the service of the Lord. And founding it, we hope to introduce nothing harsh or burdensome. But if a certain strictness results from the dictates of equity for the amendment of vices or the preservation of charity, do not be at once dismayed and fly away from the way of salvation, whose entrance cannot but be narrow. For as we advance in the religious life and in faith, our hearts expand and we run the way of God's commandments with unspeakable sweetness of love. Thus, never departing from his school, but persevering in the monastery according to his teaching until death, we may with patience share in the sufferings of Christ and deserve to have a share also in his kingdom. Thus, we see in this passage that the monastery for Benedict is a unique kind of school where one learns the way of salvation. The school is indeed strict, as is any good school, but its rewards are well worth the, tool, the toil and effort, these rewards being an expanded heart and sweetness of love and ultimately eternal salvation. Third, Benedict sees the monastery as a workshop. Good works such as love of God and neighbor, chastising the body, fasting, the corporal works of mercy, are tools of the spiritual craft, in his words. Benedict continues, if we employ them unceasingly day and night and return them on the day of judgment, our compensation from the Lord will be that wage which he has promised. Eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has promised for those who love him.
Having discussed the origins of monasticism and the founding fathers of Antony, Pacomius, and Benedict, we now turn to the general characteristics of communal monastic life, as it developed in Western Christendom. A monk was required to take a threefold vow of obedience, stability, and conversion. In taking the vow of obedience, the, monks, the monk promised obedience to the superior, the abbot of the community. This was the concrete expression of the monk's ultimate obedience to God. In the vow of stability, the monk promised to remain in the monastery where he became a monk. Finally, in the vow of conversion, the monk promised to devote himself to the monastic way of life, prayer, asceticism, humility, work, and study. Daily life in a monastery is structured according to three activities, prayer, study, and labor, or work. The most important component in the life of a monk is prayer. St. Antony spent hours in prayer. Prayer was the engine both of his personal spiritual growth and of his spiritual warfare. Cenobitic or communal monks practice a very structured type of prayer known as the divine office. It consists of liturgical prayers, psalms, chants, and scripture readings. It is done at the specific hours of the day, dawn, mid-morning, noon, 3 p.m., evening, and before bedtime, and it is done in common. It is so definitive of the monastic life but in, that in the rule of St. Benedict it is referred to simply as the opus dei, the work of God. Study is another important part of the monk's daily life. They refer to it as Lexio Divina, which literally means divine reading. It consists of a devout, prayerful, and meditative reading of sacred literature, including scripture, the church fathers, and the lives and writings of the saints. Through study, the monk seeks sapientia, wisdom, as opposed to mere scientia, or knowledge. It is learning put to the service of one's spiritual goal, personal union with God. Labor is also an important part of the daily life of a monk. Each monk has to contribute to the survival of the, and the prosperity of the monastery. In the medieval period, certain tasks were, were performed such as agriculture, cooking, woodworking, leatherworking, and copying manuscripts. Each monk was expected to spend some time each day performing some kind of assigned work. Such practice fostered a spirituality of work. Any task, however menial, is done for the glory of God and the service of one's neighbor. It also foster, fosters humility, which is the chief virtue of the monk. Now we come to humility, which is the root of all virtues. According to St. Benedict's rule, humil humility involves a number of things. First of all, it involves submission to one's superior, that is, the abbot of the monastery. It involves the patient endurance of all that is inflicted upon oneself. It involves confessing one's sins to the abbot, accepting crude and unpleasant tasks, and speaking only when questioned. All of these were directed towards the uprooting of pride, the deadliest of all sins. Now the goal of life ordered to humility was the perfection of charity. Quoting the first letter of John, Benedict calls charity that perfect love which casts out fear. It is also a love that fosters contrition, sorrow for sin, not because one fears hell, but because one has offended the God whom one loves. So the whole point of the strict monastic regimen is to become perfected in love for God and neighbor, which is the true root of spiritual, personal purity and victory over sin. In conclusion, monasticism was the single most important institution in the early Middle Ages. It became the spiritual and cultural epicenter of early medieval Europe. In the words of Hilaire Belloc, the great order of St. Benedict formed a framework of living points upon which was stretched the moral life of Europe.